Well, welcome to the second session of our exploration of the Red Horse. And again, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your word. And especially, Father, as we look at your word for guidance here, we pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us, that we might better understand what it is you would have of us in response to all these things as we commit this hour in ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua our wonderful coming King, indeed. Amen. Okay, we are in the second session, and we're going to explore the biblical view. I might start, people ask me, why do I have my flag upside down? And you, some of you recognize that's an international distress symbol. Flying your flag upside down is an international distress signal. We're trying to fix it, not the flag, the country. And it's a mess, obviously. But we're going to shift gears now, and we're going to see what the Bible tells us about the wars that are coming. And uh, so we're going to uh, remind us that you know, man tells us the world's getting better and better. But God says they're going to get increasingly worse. That's the reality that we're confronted with here. Man says that peace among nations is close at hand. I don't think so. We spared you a whole list, not just to the UN, but all the other attempts. They're nonsense. Peacemaking attempts. God says there'll be wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdoms, and indeed they continue. Man expects to win the battle against disease, famine, and hardship. No, no. That's coming in the subsequent horses we're going to look at after this one. So, technology perspectives. You know, it's really amazing. We've got whole studies on the technologies in the Bible. Uh, Matthew tells us that no flesh could be saved. That's a weapons technology that's unique to our age. That had no meaning in previous generations. But uh, we live in a, a technology in which the nuclear cloud overhangs every geopolitical decision. We find that the Bible even anticipates global TV coverage. We talked about this, I think, in the past, that uh, we're going to get a glimpse into the, into the Holy of Holies. Matthew 24, 15, Jesus tells you, when you see the abomination of desolation take place, well, that's something that takes place in the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest can go in there and only once a year after great ceremonial preparation. No, no, something's going to happen that we're going to be able to watch on, on uh, international television, apparently. That's our presumption. We also find out that it will be a little later than that, that there's going to be a resurrection of bodies that have been deliberately left in the street for three and a half days and, uh, in Revelation 11. But there again... The whole world is going to watch those bodies get resurrected. In shock, of course. They're celebrating. In fact, they're, they're, the only celebration you see in Revelation is when they're exchanging gifts because they finally got those three guys killed. And, and uh, as they rise, that should be a real exclusive for whoever's covering that TV. And one of the mostly guarded secrets we have is neutron bombs. These are nuclear devices that attack protein only. And so they're an anti-personnel form of nuclear weapon. Attractive in the sense that it doesn't damage the real estate. That the neutrons attack protein. So people in the buildings get killed, but the buildings don't get destroyed. A neutron bomb. And uh, there are several of the major, corp uh, major uh, uh, powers that have developed those as we understand it. We're going to encounter here shortly a nuclear radiation cleanup in Ezekiel 39. We'll talk about that when we get there. And we'll talk about an enigma about a third party when we get there. But the big, there are biblical wars described in the Bible. And I've tried to make a list of the main ones here. The strangest one of all will be in Psalm 2. That's where we'll start. We'll talk a little bit about what I'll call the Armageddon campaign. There really is no battle of Armageddon, by the way. It's really a staging area for an attack against Jerusalem. 
In fact, it isn't Jerusalem. We'll get to that. And we will, of course, talk about the Magog invasion, the events of Ezekiel. Many Christians are shocked to discover there are other chapters in Ezekiel besides 38 and 39, by the way. <laughs> but there, that's obviously well-traveled ground for most of you. But there's also a more imminent candidate, Psalm 83. And uh, we'll take a look at that, because I suspect, for a number of reasons, it actually precedes Ezekiel 38. And I'm also one of these that doesn't believe that Ezekiel 38 is part of the Armageddon scenario. But we'll talk about that as we get there. But there's one that really does bother me, and that'll be our final one. That's Ezekiel 39.6. We'll get there when we get there. Let's talk about the strangest war of all of them. Is the first one. You find it in Psalm 2. It's actually the weirdest of them all in my mind. And let's take a look at this. Psalm 2, we'll start verse 1, 2, and 3. The psalmist says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Against who? Two people. Against the Lord and against his anointed. That's interesting. The two of them. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. You know, I can understand people not believing God. They choose not to, and okay, I can understand that. I can understand the disregarding God, ignoring him, not keeping his rules, whatever. What I have, do not have the capacity to imagine is where people knowingly are taking up arms against God. I mean, that just is too extreme for me to embrace. The people imagine a vain thing indeed. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, here's what they're going to do. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Really? You're going to, you're going to force God to let go? <laughs> What's the, this is this is too weird for me. So, what bands or cords are they talking about? Well, the bonds of marriage was a, a godly institution that we're trying to undo in our culture. The heterosexuality of marriage is being attacked. The Ten Commandments are ignored. Really? I thought they were his inviolate law written with his finger in stone. And the rule of law in general is being attacked by the powers that be. Well, see, these first three verses seem to be the voice of the nation, maybe iterated by the Holy Spirit, whoever. But let's take a look at the next three verses, four, five, and six. I believe is the voice of the Father. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> That's God's reaction to these people that are going to take up arms against him. God, God's going to laugh. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Ooh, ouch. It's one thing for him to laugh at you. It's quite another when he gets mad at you. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet, he says, have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Ooh, okay. So let's see what the response to that is from the Son. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me. The Son speaking, quoting what the Father has said to him. Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Boy, that's graphic, isn't it? And that's a very surprisingly widely used uh, uh, rhetorical expression here. Break them with a rod of iron. Revelation 2.27, He shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. 
And she brought forth a man-child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God in his throne. We looked at that before in Revelation 12, verse 5. Between 5 and 6 is one of those intervals too, by the way. In Revelation 19. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. There it is again. There's that phrase. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now the good news is we're going to take this one up as a fifth horseman at the, as the climax of our series. So I won't spend more time now here. But the Spirit wraps this up in the last few verses of Psalm 2. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. <laughs> Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. <laughs> oh boy. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Psalm 2, often overlooked, but of all the warfare psalms, it's the one that mystifies me the most. I can't visualize knowledgeable leaders taking up arms against God. Not by oversight or mistake, no, knowingly, that's what it's talking about. That's why he's laughing at them. Well, let's take a look at another campaign. And it gets its name from Revelation 16. The day of vengeance. Remember when Jesus read his mandate in Luke 4 at the, uh, at the synagogue in Capernaum. And uh, he quotes from Isaiah 61, but he stops at a comma. And close the book and says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. The part he didn't read after the comma was in the day of vengeance. Because that's what's now in focus here. The assembling of the armies of the Antichrist in Revelation 16. And by the way, it may surprise you, there really isn't a battle of Armageddon. We use that phrase all the time because it mentions their gathering in a place which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Har Megiddon, the Mount Megiddo. That's where they gather. That's not where the battle takes place. It is to the battle what England was to the Normandy invasion. It's the place where they gathered to make the invasion. You follow me? And so, that's the Valley of Jezreel. That's a staging area for the armies coming against Jerusalem. And thus against God the Father and his Messiah. God's viewpoint is one of mockery in, in Joel 3 and Psalm 2. We saw that in Psalm 2. And we also have encounter here then the destruction of Babylon occurs somewhere along here. And that's well described in six chapters. Isaiah 13, 14, Jeremiah 15, 51, and Revelation 17, 18. A key power center at that time. Isn't yet, but will be. Because that power center is going to receive a judgment that's been detailed for us, especially in the Old Testament. And this isn't some allegory of, of the Vatican and all that. That may be part of it somehow. These are Chaldean on the banks of the Euphrates. And the, ba the, the Babylon of history never ended the way it was described in Isaiah and Jeremiah. It atrophied over the centuries. And its rebuilding was begun in recent years. But it's going to be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. That is, suddenly, quickly, in one hour, and never again to be inhabited. That's yet to happen. Watch for it. <laughs> and the fall of Jerusalem, Zechariah 12. 14 deals with that. Over half the city will be taken into slavery by the Gentile forces from the Valley of Jezreel. They're going to succeed that much. That isn't the real target. They think it is, but it ain't. Because Satan isn't really after Jerusalem. He's after the remnant that have fled to Basra. We'll see that here in a minute. See, the armies are at Basra. Je Jeremiah 49, Micah 2. The world army pursues the remnant which has fled to the mountains of Edom in Jordan. So the whole shift is, it, that's who they're after. It's my understanding that Satan thinks he can thwart the plan of God by wiping out the faithful remnant before they petition him to come back. And we have the national regeneration of Israel. The required confession occurs. The key verse here to me is Hosea 5.15. But there's others. You can take them and go through your notes and dig into them. There's a three-day campaign of pleading in Hosea 6 that follows that. 
And the national confession is detailed for us in Isaiah 53, 1 to 9. That's the real fulfillment of Isaiah 53. Many people don't realize Isaiah 53 is yet future. It's their discovery of all those things that it mentions. And we, then, of course, we have the second coming. Now, the good news is we're going to take this as a special topic when we get to the fifth uh, horseman. Because he's going to fight at Basra alone. And that person is none other than the Messiah. And uh, all that will be detailed when we go through Isaiah 63. If you want to get into it, just take a good look at the half a dozen verses of Isaiah 63 and so forth. And so, and we have this strange mention, see, from Megiddo to Petra is 1,600 furlongs, which are specifically detailed for us um, in Revelation chapter 14, interestingly enough. So that's uh, what's going on in it. From Basra to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Antichrist is powerless before Christ. His armies are destroyed at Basra. And the Megiddo, as I say, it's 176 miles there. And then the final is the victory ascent to Mount of Olives. That's what we always read about in Zechariah 14 and, and so on. So he doesn't first come to Olives. He goes there to fight for the remnant and then apparently goes there. So that's our presumption. But let's talk about this one, which is probably the most traveled piece of prophecy in modern times, Ezekiel 38 and 39, the so-called Magog invasion. And uh, so I'm going to suggest that it may be preceded by an event that will come to shortly. So I'm going to give you a little different point of view. I think there's a surprise on our horizon. And so the Magog invasion, that's the occasion in which God himself intervenes in history to quell an ill-fated invasion of Israel by Magog and his allies. Magog and his allies try to invade, but they get thwarted by God, his intervening in that whole thing. And his allies are listed for us there. Persia, Cush, Put, Libya, Gomer, Tagarma, Meshech, and Tubal. Do you ever wonder why they use these weird names? It's our fault. We keep changing the names of things. You know, there's a place called Petrograd, and then it was called Leningrad. Now it's back and forth, back and forth. In Russia, they say even the history is uncertain. But the... Uh, See, you don't change the names of your ancestors. So if you try to talk about a people, talking about the forebears is a way to identify those people that is relatively immune to linguistic changes. But the other reason this passage is so well known to most of us, it seems to anticipate the use of nuclear weapons. And we'll try to see why that is so as we go through it here in a little bit. Okay, let's just start out with Ezekiel 38. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. So Gog's a title. It happens to be a demon title. That's a whole other thing we'll get into. But now the identity, who is Magog? Turns out there's very little ambiguity about that. Hesiod, he's the Greek didactic poet of the 8th century, um, he described them as the Scythians. Herodotus, the father of history, as he's called, the 5th century, confirmed the same thing, the Scythians. And, uh, and from the 10th century to the 3rd century B.C., they dominated those, th that region. Philo, Josephus, and others, also their writings speak of it. In fact, the Great Wall of China was built to keep the Magogians out. And uh, Soviet archaeologists have discovered all kinds of confirming discoveries. But in any case, it comes from the uttermost part of the north, which is easy to figure out. The Great Wall of China is called the Ramparts of Gog and Magog by Josephus and, and others. The Scythians. See, after their repulse from Media, many of the later Scyths settled in the fertile area of the Ukraine, north of the Black Sea. And uh, others went to the east of the Caspian Sea. Herodotus describes them as living in a place called Scythia, actual country named after them a square of about 20 days journey on a side. It encompassed the lower reaches of the several rivers that dominate in that area. And that's where, this is where they, that's where it appears they were south of the, the border of Kiev. Kiev would be at the northern part of Scythia, if you will. And so that's uh, as they settled. 
And you have Meshach and Tubal settlements on the south side of the Black Sea. And Georgia is a part of that too, which is one reason it tends to be a buffer in many of the activities that are going to be going on here. And so the Scythians, they swept across the area, displacing the Sumerians from the steppes of the Ukraine east of the Dnieper River, fled from them across the Caucasus. Even the name Caucasus, we say we're, we say we're Caucasian. Caucasus appears to be derived from Gog Hassan or Gog's Fort. There's a linguistic link there, strangely enough. But jumping in, he says, I, God says, I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields and all of them handling swords. So this is God putting hooks in the jaws, drawing them into this thing. And uh, don't let vocabulary throw you. You've got a word there that's been translated horses. And some people think they'll be actual horses. They might be. But don't be misled by the vocabulary. The Hebrew word is sus. It actually means leaper, descriptive of a horse, of course, but it's um, from a root which means to skip. In Jeremiah 8:7, that word is translated as a bird. In Exodus 14:9, it's a chariot rider. So the the word has many alternative possible uses. But I won't get into all that. But you can also go all the way through here and see the contemporary possibilities. But we have Persia and. Uh, Elam, if you will, or Iran. You have Ethiopia, which is Kush, and, uh, and Libya, which is Put, the settled west of Egypt. And, uh, and Gomer and all his bands, the house of Dagarma of the north quarter, and all his bands, and many people with the Gomer, the Sumerians, settled along the Danube and, and the Rhine, includes what we think of as Poland, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, and the north quarters. Um, Tagarma is, of course, the Armenians and they call themselves the House of Tagarma even to this day in Turkey and also Turkestan. Okay, and of all the north quarters. In the uttermost parts of the north is what it actually says. In Hebrew, the word for north has been modified to imply the extreme or uttermost parts of the north, interestingly enough. And so, so we have Magog. We have these strange tribal names, but they're all going to descend upon Israel Important point, their motivation is to take spoil. Cattle and goods, gold and silver, are what they're after, strangely enough. And so their motivation is critical to understand. Okay. Now, this seems to portray a nuclear confrontation we'll see shortly. The leftover weapons are going to supply all the needs of Israel for seven years. Wow. Seven months deferral before clearing the area, then professionals are going to be hired to accomplish the cleanup. They bury all of the remains east of the Dead Sea. That's downwind, interestingly. And travelers encountering the missed items are not to touch them. They mark their location, let the professionals come and deal with them. Believe it or not, that's in the text. But the main point at the, this stage is the Magog invasion, I don't believe, I, I differ from many good scholars that do not agree with me, but I don't, I don't think this is part of the Armageddon scenario. Some, most people assume it is. Why? Because the invasion comes from the north. Armageddon will come from the whole earth. Okay. There's definite armies from the north led by Magog, not all the nations of the world. The Russian invasion is to take spoil, and Armageddon is to destroy the Jews. The seven month cleanup is inconsistent with Israel's fight. Seven years' energy requirement would carry into the millennium. Doesn't seem, from my point of view, it doesn't seem to jive. And of course, there's no mention of Antichrist, Babylon, all that sort of stuff at all here. But um, in verse 7 in chapter 39, he says, I, So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A major theme of the whole book of Ezekiel. And uh, behold, it is come, it is done, saith the Lord God, this is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears. They shall burn them with fire seven years. Really? But notice this, that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forests. 
For they shall burn their weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord God. That's kind of interesting. They don't take any wood out of the field. What kind of fuel could they be going for that lasts seven years? Nuclear comes to mind. It's the, it's the leftover weapons that they're able to use for energy for all their needs for seven years. It shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of the graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, that it shall, that's on the other side of the Dead Sea, and I shall stop the noses of the passengers and, they shall there, and there shall they bury Gog and his multitude. And they shall call it the valley of Hamangog, which means the hordes of God, of God. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them, that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, say the Lord God. Okay. Seven months they're going to be burying them. Interesting. Notice verse 14. This is a zinger. They shall sever out men of continual employment. What does that mean? They're going to sever out men of continual employment. How would I translate that? They're going to hire professionals. They shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth. To cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search. Okay. Several men of continual employment. I would say they're employing professionals. That's what I'm assuming that's saying. At the end of seven months. Why did they, why did they take that long? Seven months before entering the area. And the passengers that pass through the land. Notice this. When they seeth a man's bone, they shall set a sign up by it. They don't touch it. That's the land. They see if the man's bone, they shall set a sign up by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hemingog. And also the name of the city shall be Hamanoa. Thus shall they cleanse the land. Wow. Okay. So, when they see if the man's bone, they shall set a sign by it. Do you know where I see those instructions? In nuclear weapons materials. Your leftover weapons apply all the energy for seven years. The professionals are hired to clear the battlefield. They wait seven months, then clear for seven months. They bury the dead east of the Dead Sea. That's downwind. And if a traveler finds something the professionals have missed, he doesn't touch it. He marks the location and lets the professionals deal with it. Okay? You can find contemporary defense documents that give you those same instructions. You don't handle them unless you're trained for it. I'll move on here. But there's another event that uh, we're indebted to Bill Salas, I think, for highlighting for us some years ago, and I think he's done us a service because it was an overlooked psalm, I think. An eminent candidate here. There's a couple of mysteries about the Ezekiel 38 thing. Where are the Lebanese? Where are the Syrians in Ezekiel 38? Where is Iraq, the Jordanians, the Egyptians, Saudi Arabians? Saudi Arabia's on the sidelines. They're not participants, strangely. And then the Palestinians, where are they? You see, it's interesting. They are the immediate neighbors. If you study the previous tribes, they're, the dis they're a substantial distance from Israel. These are the immediate neighbors. They're not mentioned. What's going on here? There are four prerequisites for Ezekiel 38, by the way. The nation has to be reestablished as a sovereign state. It has been. The nation is militarily secure. Well, yes and no. A nation at apparent peace in the Middle East? I don't think so. A nation of restored material fortunes? Well, they're not doing badly, but not like we're going to see here. There's something else back in Ezekiel 37. Before 38, you get the, the whole dry bones thing and all that. And in that verse, in verse 10 of Ezekiel 37, it says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And the exceedingly is an adverb, not an adjective. 
which is a very strange construction. That means they become a very great army. And there were four steps in the dry bones vision. They were scattered, they came together, flesh and skin, and then they came to life. But then they became an exceedingly great army. And the, the fact that it's an adverb is very strange. Is there an overlooked event that precedes the ill-fated invasion attempt that's featured in Ezekiel 38 and 39? That's a question. And I think a guy has surfaced that may be the key to all of this. A guy with a backbone to really pull it off. We'll watch and see. The book of Psalms, Psalm 83, let's take a look, quick look at it. Is this a forthcoming scenario? It's the last of the Asaph Psalms. It's the, it's the last one of these. And it's a rather timely one. Keep not thy silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up their head. The psalmist here is trying to get God's attention. Okay? Thine enemies make a tumult. They that hate thee have lifted up the head. It's like saying, hey God, aren't you paying attention? Whoever these enemies are, they hate God and are lifting their head. That's who we're talking about here. He continues, They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. Thy people. God, are you paying attention here? See, they declare that they will attempt to wipe Israel off the map. And by the way, when I first read that, I thought, that's pretty interesting. I didn't even know they allowed them on any maps. <laughs> that their enemies had them on the map. When their enemies say they want to wipe Israel off the map, that's a concession I didn't know they made. I didn't know it was on their maps. <laughs> they have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Understand their motivation. They're not taking spoil. They're confederating in order to cut them off from being a nation. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel shall be no more in remembrance. They have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee, O God. The psalmist is trying to get God's attention here. And that's the very commitment of Islam, isn't it? To wipe Israel off the face of the map. Okay. And it's the basis of the confederation. That's what unites them. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines and Gebal and Ammon and Amalek and the Philistines, the inhabitants of Tyre, Ashur is joined with them. They have Hope and the children of Lot. It goes through these tribal names, but the, perhaps the most interesting one is the first one mentioned, the tabernacles of Edom. There's probably not one Christian in ten that can tell me who the Edomites really are. It's a very important study to undertake, by the way. But the tents of Edom here is a reference to the traditional enemies of Israel and the everlasting hatred. The Alam Eba. The everlasting hatred. That started in the womb before they were born. Jacob and Esau, remember? They were fighting before they were born. And the hostility of Esau is something you need to track all the way through your Bible. You won't really understand. Of all the different tribes, the one that's singled out for judgment are the Edomites, more so than all the others. The everlasting hatred. And now it continues to drive events throughout our world today is driven by that. The, the judgment against this protagonist is mentioned in more Old Testament books than it is against any other foreign nation. So you need to do your homework on who the Edomites are. And yet very few observers can identify its proponents in their contemporary forms. That's a trick. See, ascent into the land of Israel officially began in 586 B.C. with the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. When the Babylonians took, them, took Jerusalem captive, that's when the Edomites had their big chance. They cheered the Babylonians on. Banged the heads of the infants against the rocks, they yelled. You see them now quote that in a psalm, but they're echoing what was said to them 
by the Edomites back when the Babylonians were taking them captive. A place called Hebron, which is about 19 miles south of Jerusalem, began their new frontier as the, as the, as the real estate was vacated because the Babylonians were taking them slaves. The Edomites moved in, took over, cheered, cheered their enemies on. 3,400 feet above sea level, established 1,500 years earlier, like, unlike Jerusalem, was left intact as prime real estate. So you need to remember that the Nabataeans migrated out of Arabia into Edom and drove the Edomites westward. And uh, directly west of Edom were the established routes of passage. I'll show you this on a map here in a minute. See, land was historically more prosperous and resourceful uh, than the land of Edom. So, unfertile deserts and jagged mountains. And so, the land bore a family association, Esau with Jacob. The land vacated since the Jews were being exported in activity. So, Edom on your maps shows south east of the Dead Sea. That's where your maps, that's where it used to be. Your maps are wrong because the Nabataeans drove the Edomites westward. The land was better westward. And so the Nabataeans drove them, and they set up a map. If you get some of the early Roman maps in the first century, they will show an area called Idumea. That's the Greek term of Edomite. And uh, their capital was Hebron. And so they prosper as Judah is taken into slavery to the, uh, to the Babylonians. Now something you may not know Hebron remained under Edomite control until Judas Maccabeus retook the city under Jewish control. In 164 BC, we have the, 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 they threw off the Greek, the Greek Empire. They reestablished their own leadership under the, what we call the Hasmoneans. What may, most people don't realize is that they, uh, the Edomites had to be reconquered by the Jewish army under the prince and high priest, John Hyrcanus. And Idumeans were forced to either die or flee or be proselytized into Judaism. So these were Edomites that either were, had, were killed or had to convert into Judaism. That's something that's a, that's a part of Jewish history you don't hear much about. It's all in Josephus. You can check it out, both in First Maccabees and also in Josephus and, and, and Antiquities. Now, so uh, to the Roman mind... An Edomite is a near Jew. He regards the Esau-Jacob thing as a family feud. So an Edomite to a Roman is a, a, a near Jew, an almost Jew. So when they appoint Edomites to be in charge, they think they're picking the right guys. See? 47, Julius Caesar promoted Idumean Antipater as procurator over Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. And ten years later, the Romans named Herod son of Antipater, as a king over Israel. And by the way, his mother was Nabataean, one of those that drove the Edomites to Hebron. The Edomians had five centuries of prior history in Israel by the time of the arrival of Jesus. So they had five, five hundred years of history. The struggle between Esau and Jacob runs all through the Bible. The Herods of the New Testament were Edomites. They weren't Jewish, they were Edomites. One of them killed the Jewish babes in his attempt to destroy Christ in Matthew 2. Another, mur uh, Herod, murdered John the Baptist. Another one killed James, the brother of John. The struggle between the Israelis and the Muslims today is but a continuation of this same battle because Esau deliberately marries in to the Ishmaelites. In their choice of the Jews' worst enemy, the Romans had two choices. They wanted to rename the land uh, 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 in terms of their worst enemy. They had two choices. They could call it Idumea or they could call it Philistia. And they chose Philistia as being a more clearer, crisper enemy, so that the Latin name was Palestinia. Idumeans were viewed as practitioners of Judaism and not as great an enemy as were the Philistines. And there are many who still appear today as Jews, but are really not. And they might be the ones that Jesus refers to twice in his letters. Those that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. The tents of Edom. Here's some tents of Edom. These are um, refugee camps that are quite nef nef famous. 
the one you're looking at there has 97,000 occupants. A Palestinian refugee, refugee camp. Are they all Edomites? Of course not. Are there Edomites there? Absolutely. But anyway, the psalmist here in 83, picking him up again, he's asking God to do to them as he did his pre their previous enemies. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera and Jabin at the brook of Kesan, which perished at Endor, they became as dung for the earth. Do unto them as unto. See, the psalmist petitions God to undertake destruction of their enemies as he did during the events of the past. That's what he's asking for. The Midianites, the Arabian tribe that descended from Midian, the fourth son of Abraham by Keturah. They inhabit primarily the desert north of the peninsula of Arabia. As to Sisera and Jabin, he was, uh, Sisera was the uh, captain of the host of Jabin, the Canaanite king who reigned in Hazor, routed by Barak at the plain of Estrelon, killed by Jael. A, it's all in Judges. He's making references from Judges 4 and 5 here. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, and yea, like the princesses. These are the nobles, the, the uh, king, the prince generals, and so forth. The prince generals were Oreb and Zeb. Zeba and Zalmuda were their kings. But those, those four represented the people that God uh, went to war against on their behalf. He said, let us make to ourselves the houses of God in possession. They were defeated by Gideon. The Mediterranean intercepted the Midianites and slew with a great slaughter and so forth. And the psalmist goes on, O God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth the wood, and as a flame setteth the mountains on fire. So persecute them with thy tempest and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name, O Lord. See, the Lord's name is the issue here, strangely. The psalmist continues, Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. The psalmist is asking God to establish his name over the, these losers. That whose name alone is Jehovah. That's in, in contrast to Al-Ilah, or Allah, the moon god. Apparently the only way the world is going to know that God is God is for him to move in judgment. That's what the psalmist is presuming here. Well, we also discover when Jesus comes back, I won't get into the details here, but you should have perspective. In Ezekiel 25 through 32, it lists seven nations. Edom's right in the middle of these, and it's the worst of the bunch, by the way. But they are all Islamic. Why are there seven? For completeness, I guess. Interesting. At the present time, Israel is surrounded by immediate neighbors committed to wiping them off the map. That describes us today, doesn't it? Pick up any paper any day. And by the way, it's misleading to represent them as Arabs. That's just a vestige of a total, totally ignorant, uninformed press corps. They're not Arabs. They're Muslims. There are a number of the Muslims that are offended by being called Arabs. The Persians, for example, and others. It would appear that there's a prerequisite victory for Israel that will set the stage for a subsequent ill-fated attempt of uh, the outer ring nations to seek spoil. I think the success of Israel in Psalm 83 may set the stage for them being an attractive target for Ezekiel 38. That's my perception here. What are the order of events? I think Israel's regathered in land. We've just seen that happen. Ancient cities have been rebuilt and inhabited. They meet Muslim and Arab resistance, of course. Israel establishes an army for defense. Adjacent Muslim nations confederate. That's what we're seeing happen here. The confederacy committed to the destruction of Israel is what we're talking about. A war starts between the confederacy and Israel. The title is regained. My pe God again speaks them as my people Israel. That's a non-trivial label that God would be using of them. Israel decisively defeats the confederacy. That's the big thing, and there's plenty of verses for you to check that out. Israel then becomes an exceedingly great army. It's an adverb. It becomes 
vastly more powerful than it is today. Israel takes prisoners of war, we find. Jeremiah 48 and elsewhere. The region, the whole region is reshaped. They reshape it. None of this, you know, West Bank nonsense. Israel expands its borders. High time. Israel then dwells securely in the land. That fits the case that Ezekiel 38 seems to be describing. Okay. So that's a, that's a viewpoint. It's uh, not a widely held viewpoint. But it's, it's, uh, it is, for what it's worth, it's, that's a view. And, uh, but I want to bring your attention to something that somehow gets overlooked by so many. There's a third party involved in Ezekiel 38. 38 is the contest and 39 is the cleanup afterwards. But in 39 we have an interesting footnote. Ezekiel 39 verse 6. God says, I will send a fire on Magog. No surprise. Magog is investing in, in, in uh, baiting Israel. God is protecting Israel from them. So a fire set on Magog is no surprise. Sort of a summary statement of most of the verses that preceded this. I will send fire on Magog. And, oh, among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Well, that's a little footnote, a little addition. What's that all about? And among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. In addition to Magog and Israel, it appears to me there's a third party that gets tangled up in this somehow. Somebody that's not Magog, because we've already covered them. It certainly isn't Israel getting hit. What is going on here? A third party. In the Isles. Now there's a troublesome word. The he, Isles the, he, is, is just a little uh, yod, uh, Aleph Yod thing. E. The word appears 36 times in the scripture. It used Isle 30 times, like an island somewhere, or islands in plural, five times. Country, it's used as a country once. And it's apparently a remote, pleasant place is the way it seems to be used. The Isles. It seems to suggest a coast, an island, or a shore. That's the way it seems to be used. Who are these people? They, among them that dwell carelessly in the shores or whatever. Some suggest even a remote continent. Okay, maybe so. That dwell carelessly. Strange word. In the Hebrew, the word is betash. It means in false, in confi- but in false confidence. It's obviously false confidence because they're going to get clobbered. But they're dwelling as if they're safe. That's what the word means. Really. I will send fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Boy. I have wrestled this for some years. Trying to construct alter- options, alternatives. Who is this third party? I don't know. Don't misunderstand me. I don't know. Could it be the U.S.? That's what I tend to visualize. The U.S. saber-rattling on behalf of Israel. Magog's starting to make their moves and the U.S. says, don't do that or else, whatever. There's a line in the sand or whatever. You know, We're saber-rattling on behalf. And we get clobbered as a result. Do we become collateral damage that constitutes an overdue judgment? See, the question I get confronted with when I travel, we have a Q&A. We always have a Q&A after we speak for a while. The predictable question is, why hasn't God judged America already? I used to use Genesis 12, 2 and 3 as a defense. That's why he hasn't, because we've st- stood for Israel. Not anymore. We officially no longer stand for Israel. There are people in the U.S. that would like to, but our administration is notoriously pro-Muslim. But in any case, could God use the warheads of Magog to be an instrument of his judgment of America? 
boy, it's hard for me to come up with alternatives on that. That one's a tough one. I wonder, is this the reason that the United States is conspicuously absent in all of the remaining eschatological references? You go through the Bible and speaking of end time, this, that, and the other thing, you have all these different names, all these different groups that are well identified. A couple of subtleties we wonder about, but pretty much, pretty clear. We know Tagarma, Gomer, we, we, we can track those things. Where's the U.S.? It's not. It's absent. And that's one of the reasons that I worry more about Ezekiel 39, verse 6, than I do the EMP. Now, I don't have to worry about EMP because I'm in the Southern Hemisphere. I had a lot of fun. I had a, I had a nice long phone call with Hal Lindsey, a dear friend of mine from way back. And he was saying, Chuck, why, why New Zealand? Why are you in New Zealand? I couldn't help but try to pull, pull his leg a little bit. I said, well, Hal, you know the number one vulnerability in the homeland of Department of Secu Homeland Security is uh, uh, EMP. The way you avoid EMP is to be in the other hemisphere. It's the only, the only sure defense against it. There's a long pause in the phone, and before he responded to that, I said, there's another issue. Uh, you know that, that uh, everybody that's been in the strategic arena with, nuclear, with nukes has the belief that a nuclear exchange is also inevitable. It's going to happen someday. And... Uh, and all the com nuclear combatants are in the Northern Hemisphere. There's Europe, China, Russia, the U.S. They're all in the Northern Hemisphere. That's why I'm in the Southern Hemisphere. There's a long pause on the phone before Hal <laughs> realized I was just pulling his chain. What I said was true, but that, that's not, we're not here for that reason. We're here because God called us here a long time ago. We've been on the radio here for, what, 16 years, something like that, every day. No, we, uh, but I have to tell you candidly, I don't know why God moved us here. We're here because he moved us here. And we enjoy it. We love New Zealand for a lot of reasons. But the more I see us here strategically, the more comfortable I am. Uh, that, may, that may be one of the reasons he's had us establish our headquarters in the Southern Hemisphere. Because it's distant from all, these other, all this other turmoil that clearly is coming one way or the other. So with that, I think I'll let you close for a a sincere prayer too. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for who you are and we thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your word. We pray, Father, that through your spirit you would guide each of us that we each might better comprehend what it is that you would have of each of us in the days ahead. That we could be ever more effective for you, more pleasing in your sight as we deal with these uncertainties. We do pray, Father, that we might be effective for your agenda for your priorities, not our own, as we commit our way into your hands without any reservations whatsoever. We commit our way into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our, our Lamb that was slain indeed. We thank you for our coming King. Maranatha indeed. Amen.